Uh, good evening and welcome to our last instalment of this series of conversations, Hardwired Human Consciousness and Christian Belief. My name is Sarah Wilson. I'm the Program Director for ISCAST. And I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the lands upon which we meet. Our Heavenly Father entrusted the estate from where I'm speaking from tonight to the stewardship of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation. And as we continue to learn together on these ancestral lands, we pay respects to Indigenous elders past and present. We have Samuel Calder speaking to us. He is a lecturer in philosophy and theology at St Cyril's Coptic Orthodox Theological College and is a fellow of the Orthodox Christian Studies Centre at Fordham University. He has published articles and chapters on the Cambridge Platonists, I hope I've pronounced that correctly, as well as on Orthodox theology, patristic and contemporary. His most recent book is The Cambridge Platonists and Early Modern Philosophy, Inventing the Philosophy of Religion. First of all, thank you, Sarah, for the introduction and to um, Iskast and everyone for uh, having me along. It's a real pleasure to be part of this very interesting conversation series, um, which has been very diverse and it's gonna get even more diverse tonight because uh, I think I'll be speaking about a figure in the history of philosophy um, that most people have never heard of. So it's uh, it's one of the like joys of working in this area of like early modern philosophy that you get to introduce people to um, figures who deserve a bit more attention than they um, than they actually usually get. So yeah, I'm going to be talking about the idea of consciousness in one of the earliest philosophers to think about it in the English speaking philosophical tradition. Um, and his name was Ralph Cudworth. So to introduce him, as I said, you probably haven't heard of him. And that's because the canon, if you want to call it that, of uh, philosophers and thinkers who we consider to be important um, in any generation tends to be decided by the generations that come after based on the things that they value. Um, so the period in which Ralph Codworth was active as a philosopher was the 17th century. So that's the age of Rene Descartes and Isaac Newton and Robert Boyle and John Locke and Thomas Hobbes and many others. Um, and the heroes of the, uh, the philosophical story that we tell in our century um, are the ones who were involved in what we now call the scientific revolution, right? The ones who moved away from Aristotelian and uh, older antiquated ways of thinking and towards what we think of now as the scientific method, um, hypotheses and experiments and that sort of thing. And for that reason, um, Cudworth was supportive of those movements and he was in intellectual contact with people like Robert Boyle and Isaac Newton. He actually was uh, very close to Isaac Newton, just geographically, they, they, their um, like quarters at Cambridge were not far from each other, but he wasn't directly involved in the actual work that came to, um, that became so influential in the development of modern science. Um, if anything, to modern eyes, he looks a little bit backwards looking. He was there reading Plato and the Church Fathers um, and Aristotle when everybody else was moving on towards uh, more exciting things. Uh, so that's one of the reasons why, even though he was actually quite prominent in his own time, uh, he's not much remembered today. Uh, but nonetheless, he still has a few really important claims to uh, philosophical attention and to our continued attention, even if we're not philosophers. So one of them is he's the first English writer to use two terms that have become standard in uh, philosophy and in science. Uh, one of them is philosophy of religion. So there's a whole field of philosophy of religion. Codworth is the first person, in English at least, to speak of the philosophy of religion and to write a work that is explicitly a work in philosophy of religion. And the second one, more pertinent for tonight, is he's the first English writer to use the word consciousness in the way that we use it today. And so virtually everyone who was writing about consciousness in the decades and centuries after afterwards was in some way reacting to the initial ideas put forward by someone like uh, by by Ralph Cudworth. Uh, so he's he was an important contributor to the discussion, right? Uh, and also just because um, he doesn't fit into the ordinary canon doesn't mean he's not interesting, right? I think as a general principle, um, our picture of philosophy uh, benefits a lot, and our understanding of our own age benefits a lot when we look at figures beyond the ones that our particular narrative uh, highlights as having been the most significant. So that's who he was. 
in order to understand his view of consciousness, uh, which, as I said, he was the first one to use that word uh, in English um, in the sense that we use it, it's going to be helpful to go back a little bit and look at Descartes. Because uh, in many ways, what Cudworth has to say about consciousness, and particularly the moral dimension of consciousness, which is what I'm leading up to, uh, has to do with Cudworth's response to what he saw as the kind of oversimplifying of things by Rene Descartes. Um, so for Descartes, just to sort of recap for anyone who's not familiar, for better or worse, the Cartesian way of thinking about this thing is still probably the most influential like in terms of early modern philosophers who have the biggest influence on the way that we today think about philosophy of mind, Descartes is probably still one of the most influential. And for Descartes, the whole universe was comprised of only two kinds of things, two substances, he called them. Uh, one is mind and the other is matter. And the difference between the two is that the mind is a thing that thinks, anything that thinks is a mind, and anything that isn't in that category is something that has what he calls a res extensa, means it's something that has extension. In other words, it takes up space in the universe, right? It's uh, like a table or a dog or a human body. Anything that takes up space is matter. Whereas anything that thinks is mind and is immaterial, doesn't take up any space. Um, and also, uh, that's where you have thinking. And for Descartes, so, yeah, there's only two kinds of things, right? There's physical things that are material, take up space, and there's minds that don't. And for Descartes, this is a really strict dualism, right? You have to be, everything is either one or the other. Either a thing is a mind or it's um, made of matter. And the two, never the twain shall meet. Uh, so what that means in practice is that for Descartes, there are only a limited number of things that are minds. So God is a mind. God isn't a physical being. Uh, angels and demons are also minds and human beings, human souls, at least are minds. And for Descartes, consciousness belongs to minds. If you have a mind, you have consciousness. If you don't have a mind, you're not conscious. And everything else that isn't God or an angel or a demon or a human mind is made of matter and is totally inanimate. It's totally, uh, totally passive and, um, totally material. So that includes everything in the physical world, including plants, animals, and human bodies. And so this is why uh, you have in Descartes a mind-body problem, right? The mind is this immaterial thing, and it's very, very different to the body, which is a material thing, which takes up space in the universe and is extended in physical space and time, whereas the mind is not. And there's this problem about how the mind, which is very, very different to the body, interact with each other? What exactly is the relationship between the mind and the brain and the rest of the human body? Um, so yes, everything else for Descartes, even if it looks conscious, something like a dog, for example, um, seems to have emotions and it looks and it has expressions and that those sorts of things. Because Descartes doesn't consider it to be a mind or to have a mind, an immaterial soul behind those eyes, uh, he thinks of them as just very complicated machines, right? So those are the only two things in the world for Descartes. Now, Cudworth, who's writing a little bit beyond, uh, a little bit after Descartes' time, wanted to respond to this because he felt that Descartes' system of dividing everything up into either material things or minds was too simplistic, too binary. So instead of Descartes' two substances, he kind of corrected them and he proposed two principles. And instead of mind and matter, Cudworth's principles were life on one end and body, or he sometimes calls it bulk on the other end. And in some ways, it's a similar distinction to Descartes, but in other ways, it's really different. So for Cudworth, the two, the main characteristics of body are that body is made of atoms. It's corporeal, right? It's also passive, which means it only moves when it's acted on by something else. And of course, it doesn't think or feel. That's those are the main characteristics of body. The main characteristics of the other principle, which he calls life rather than mind, are self-activity. So first of all, actually, it's incorporeal. It's not made of atoms like body is. But more importantly, it's unlike body, it's active instead of passive. It's self-moving and free. It's not only moved when other things move it, it can move of itself. And thought and consciousness belong to uh, this side of things. So it's important to realize, because like I said, part of Cudworth's problem with Descartes was that he was too binary and dualistic. Uh, life and body are not 
two distinct categories with a nice thick red line between them. They're actually two points on a spectrum. That's a much better way to think about it. So where Descartes kind of chopped up all the things that exist into minds on one side and material things on the other side, Cudworth kind of spreads them out along a spectrum. So we're going to sort of come back to these examples a few times. So I thought I'd just go through them. But at one end of the spectrum, at the pure body passive end of the spectrum, you have physical matter which is not alive in any way. So think of just, you know, rocks and water and ice, things like that. Those are pure body, right? There's just, all they are really is atoms and they're totally passive. A rock will never do anything unless something else comes and moves it or does something to it. I suppose there is the exception and Cudworth does discuss this a little bit that rocks, you know, very, very slowly move and grow and that sort of thing over time in, you know, processes like geological processes. But Cudworth sort of views that as the very faint, tiny little trace of life that's present even in that extreme end of body. But pretty much rocks are about as body as you can get. Then just above them, a little bit more alive, a little bit more active than rocks, you have plants. And plants grow obviously much faster than you know sedimentation uh, in rocks does. Um, and you can see how they are more active in a way, right? They take in nutrients and they photosynthesize and they breathe in oxygen and so on, uh, so on and so forth. Um, uh, and in that way, they're a little bit more active than rocks, but they are still mostly passive. You can do virtually anything to a plant. And unless it's a, a venomous, um, like a Venus flytrap, it probably won't do anything back. Then you take one step further up, a little bit closer towards activity and life and further away from passivity and corporeality, you have animals. Animals are much more active than plants, obviously. Um, but they're still passive in the sense that they're driven by instinct. And we'll talk about that in particular. Then the most active and living thing that you have on earth, at least for Cudworth, is a human being. Human being is not only driven by instinct, uh, but can think intentionally and rationally and can make decisions that they're morally responsible for. So obviously that's what we're going to zoom in on in a, in a moment. And then, of course, the most living thing and the most active thing for uh, Cudworth is God, God himself. And I'm a good apophatic orthodox, so I don't, I'm not going to give an image of God there. I could, I suppose I could put an icon of Christ or something, but I'm just putting a theta there to represent his um, incorporeality. Um, okay, so where does consciousness fit on this much more nuanced spectrum that Cudworth has? Well, just as the whole thing is a spectrum rather than a binary, there's no specific hard point where consciousness begins. Instead, it's more of a spectrum, right? At the very, very bottom, the body end of the spectrum, there's no consciousness. Uh, so rocks, Cudworth thinks, I think quite uncontroversially, have no consciousness. Plants, he thinks, are not conscious in any meaningful sense, although we'll see there's a tiny bit of him that thinks there might be a sort of shadow of consciousness. Animals, unlike Descartes, who thought because they don't have rational minds, they must not have any consciousness. Cudworth thought, well, animals aren't rational, but they are conscious, right? They do have a kind of feeling and awareness, self-awareness that plants lack, um, and certainly the rocks lack. Uh, human beings have a more complicated kind of consciousness, and God is supremely conscious. And this is where I think Cudworth is really interesting as a Christian philosopher of mind, right? Because he basically views consciousness as a property that belongs first and foremost to God, consciousness is a divine property and to the extent that anything else has it even animals it's they have it by participation to varying degrees uh in god and this is going to be really important for uh the way in which consciousness plays into his moral philosophy all right so um i've already sort of said this already but let's just see how this works right so plants are the least living thing in cudworth's uh cudworth's view he calls them the last and lowest of all lives which uh, incidentally is a good thing to call someone that you don't like. Um, just copy that away somewhere for, for later use. Although he does think that because Cudworth is basically a Platonist and he thinks that everything um, exists by participating in God, even this last and lowest of all lives has what he calls a shadowy imitation of mind and understanding, which is just reflected in the way that they grow in orderly ways and they reflect beautiful patterns and so on. There's a little hint or echo or memory of something like rational conscious thought, um, but it's only a very, very faint shadow because um, they don't feel anything. So we can skip past them. Where Cudworth really talks about consciousness, though, 
is, and this is in stark contrast to Descartes, in terms of animals. So he takes particular aim at Descartes and criticizes him, as several people have, for cruelly supposing that animals aren't conscious. So the way that Cudworth defines consciousness, and he does this with respect to animals, first and foremost, uh, is here. And this is, you know, I'm saying Cudworth is the first person to use the word consciousness in the modern philosophical sense. This is it in his uh, True Intellectual System, published in uh, uh, 1672, I believe. Um, so he says, animals have consense and consciousness. There it is which makes a being to be present with itself, attentive to its own actions. And that means that it can perceive itself to do or suffer. And this is a thing that Cudworth thinks characterizes the mental lives of animals. Um, a really interesting word that Cudworth uses to explain what consciousness is, you can sort of see it happening in this definition here, is duplication. So essentially what he thinks consciousness is in animals, at least, is this kind of doubling of the self or doubling of the mind. So you can think of it this way. If uh, I was to poke a plant's leaf with a pin, only one thing has happened, which is there's been a particular motion of a pin through the leaf's um, structure. So there's just that sort of one flat level event. Whereas in an animal, if I was, God forbid, to poke a pin through a dog's paw, um, I have a dog, so this is a very uncomfortable thought to even think about. But if that was to happen, two things would have happened. There would have been the physical event of the pin entering the dog's paw, but also there would have been a second dog, another dog self to whom that was happening. That's what he calls duplication. And so that's essentially what Codworth means when he says that a being who has this consense or consciousness is present with itself, attentive to its own actions. It means there's a subject there, right? There's something for the pin going through to happen to or to happen for. Uh, so animals have that duplication, right? There's a sort of second dog in there to whom this stuff happens. But they're still importantly not conscious in the same way that humans are, uh, in the sense that they lack reason, right? They're still importantly passive. Remember, passivity is a characteristic of body and bulk. They're still importantly passive in the way that they are determined by their appetites and their instincts. So he says they do not understand the reason of their actions, even though they are generally uh, conceived to be conscious of them. Um, and they're under a necessity of following their fancies and appetites. So we'll come back to that in a moment. Humans have a more complicated kind of consciousness. So remember with dogs, it was duplication, right? There's like one other dog. So you could think of that as like level one consciousness. Plants are level zero, they've got nothing going on, and rocks as well. Then dogs are level one consciousness. Human beings have what you could think of as level two consciousness, because in addition to that first level where we can feel pain and experience things as though they were happening to us, we also have a reduplication where that doubled soul is sort of doubled again back on itself. And we can not only feel things and experience them as happening to us as a subject, we can then also experience our experiences. We can judge and determine whether or not we like what we're feeling, whether or not we want to act on the instincts that we have. So he describes the soul of a human being as being redoubled, right? not just doubled. Uh, he says that which is properly we ourselves is the soul comprehending itself and holding itself as it were in its own hand, as it were redoubled upon itself. And that's what gives us the free will and moral responsibility that animals act, right? As he says, we can reflect upon ourselves and consider ourselves, which is a reduplication of life in a higher degree. And as a result, we do not act fatally only, uh, but electively and intendingly with consciousness and self-perception. In other words, we can judge and evaluate our subjective experiences and then choose to act on them or not, or choose to act on them in different ways. So that means that even though we are conscious and dogs are also conscious. For Cudworth, we're conscious in different ways. This is an important difference to Descartes, right? For whom, as we saw, conscious, consciousness is like an on-off switch. You're either conscious or you're not. You're either a mind or you're an extended thing. Um, Cudworth is able to recognize that there are different levels of consciousness and that we have one uh, and that animals have another. And it's important that our kind of consciousness is more divine. It's closer to the archetypal conscious being, which is God, than the animal consciousness is. Um, okay, so how does this all fit into morality? Because what I really want to end with, um, coming uh, close to the end now, is just the idea that, well, in 
modern moral philosophy, at least, consciousness we view, perhaps due to the influence of Descartes, as a very all or nothing feature, but also uh, as something that's sort of morally neutral, right? It's a feature of the world that's capable of scientific uh, investigation. Um, and it's just like gravity or black holes or anything else in there, right? But it should already be um, sort of coming out that for Cudworth, who's the first person to engage with this topic really seriously in English, consciousness is an inherently moral concept, right? To be conscious is a good thing. To be less conscious is a bad thing. In other words, in sort of more antiquated terms, consciousness is a kind of perfection. That's why it belongs first and foremost to God. And then lesser creatures partake of it to varying degrees. So to see how that works, to see how consciousness works in Cudworth's moral system, uh, let's take a relatable example. Um, the example of a cookie that is unlawfully eaten. So suppose that you've put a cookie out on a table and then you've instructed, well, we're going to consider it in two cases and the difference between the two should highlight what Cudworth is saying, I hope. So consider in the first case that you tell your dog not to eat the cookie because it has chocolate chips in it and chocolate can depress dogs and we don't want that. And then consider in the second case that you tell a human being, perhaps your child or your partner, not to eat the cookie that you've left on the table. And then suppose that you leave the room and come back to find the cookie eaten. Well, two very different things have happened on a Cudworthian reading of this situation. If an animal did it, there's no moral responsibility. There's no moral blame to be assigned to the dog who has committed this crime. Because uh, dogs, despite being conscious, can't act otherwise than they actually do. So the reason, if anyone is responsible, it's you for leaving the room and leaving the cookie unattended. Because the dog has a natural instinct to eat food. That's the way that it's programmed. And dogs are completely passive to the instincts that they find in them. Remember, they're kind of lower down on the scale of life and body. And one of the characteristics of lower things on the scale is to be passive, like rocks, right? Just things happen to you. And so a dog will get an instinct and they don't have this second level of consciousness to evaluate whether or not they want to follow that instinct. They just have to follow it. Um, as Codworth says it, animals are under a necessity of following their fancies and appetites to a sensual good only. They're not masters of that wisdom according to which they act, but are only passive to the instincts and impresses thereof upon them. So the fact that they're conscious, that they feel things, that they probably enjoyed eating the cookie doesn't mean that they made a conscious moral decision. They were conscious, but they weren't morally responsible. If a human were to do the same thing, it's a different story. What would have happened in a human is a human, this, you know, your partner or your child who has eaten the cookie unlawfully, they felt the same biological instinct that the dog felt, right? They saw a cookie, they thought it would have good nutritional value, it would taste nice, and that moved them to consume it. Uh, in a dog, that's the end of the story. And the second they get that instinct, they will act on it. In a human being, when that instinct comes, <clears throat> there is an opportunity to use your higher level of consciousness to kind of put that instinct in context, right? So what's happening with the cookie is your body is presenting you with an appear, what Cudworth would call an appearance of good, right? What you're doing in that case is you're attending to some appearance of good. But if you were to eat the cookie, you would be focusing on that particular appearance of good without taking notice of any of the evils attending it. Right. In this case, eating the cookie is a good thing in so far as it goes, considered in and of itself. There's nothing evil about a cookie. But the problem is that in this case, it happens to contradict eating the cookie would contradict a deeper and higher moral principle of honesty or of self-restraint or whatever reason you have to not eat the cookie. Um, and a human who's capable of level two consciousness of feeling the instinct and then evaluating and responding to it is... It also, they have a responsibility, by consequence, to be properly aware of all the things that are relevant to a situation, not just the immediate appearance of some good. And so Cudworth's reading of the moral fault in this case, if you were to eat the cookie, is that you failed to take into, all, into account all the circumstances. In other words, you acted unreflectively. You didn't act with the level of conscious intention and awareness that is fitting for human beings. You acted more like an animal than uh, like a human being. It's very harsh language for the relatively small crime of eating a cookie, but Cudworth is no, doesn't think that cookies are joking matters, laughing matters. Um, so this is actually a really significant philosophical point, right? It's actually quite a controversial one too, because what it basically means, um, I won't go into this too much, but it's worth noting because it is controversial, basically means that Cudworth doesn't think 
that it's possible to think about a situation clearly and intentionally and then choose the wrong thing. All moral faults, every single moral failure boils down to a failure to think things properly through. In other words, in his framework, it's a failure to be properly conscious. So here's how he describes why someone is blameworthy for making an immoral choice, like eating a cookie that they shouldn't have eaten. Uh, they're to blame, he says, because he might have made a better judgment than he now did, had he more intensely considered and more maturely deliberated, which that he did not was his own fault. So the moral failure, the evil thing, was just a failure to properly apply, to be properly conscious. Um, you stopped at the level of animal instinct and didn't apply that extra layer of human consciousness, which is what separates you from an animal, makes you more godlike. Um, okay, why is this bad? Well, of course, there's nothing wrong with being an animal if that's what God has made you. But if as a human being, you exist on the level of an animal and don't live uh, in the way that is more appropriate to a rational being, in sort of New Testament language, we could think of that as the spirit. Um, being subjected to the flesh, you know, the flesh warring against the spirit. The flesh is the animal part of the human being, which is good in and of itself, but it has to be subordinated to the spirit. Uh, in that case, you're becoming, you're kind of moving down the scale away from the God and life and active end and more towards the passive, bulky, rock-like end, right? And that's because you're letting yourself be determined passively by these instincts that are coming upon you. And these instincts are very uh, material and bodily, right? They have to do with uh, pleasure and nutrition and reproduction and that sort of thing. Um, he uses very violent language to describe the way in which instincts like that come upon us. So for example, um, he speaks of the suggestion of the lower appetites urging and impelling to pressure or present good or profit. So to the extent that you give in to those instincts, to that extent, you're becoming less conscious and more bulk-like, more body-like and passive. But to the extent that you act with intention and knowledge, you're becoming more active and more godlike, right? Uh, he specifically differentiates acting from knowledge from the kind of being buffeted and violently pushed around by instincts. Uh, he says, knowledge is not a knock or thrust from without, but an awakening and exciting of the inward active powers of the mind. For Cudworth, that's part of what it means to be conscious to be active and inward, right? Acting from within you rather than being pushed around by currents that are coming from outside of you, which he thinks uh, bodily instincts like hunger and so on are. And the very final point I'll make is that for Codworth, ultimately, what this leads to is a doctrine of deification, which was quite unusual in the Protestantism of his time. He was a 17th century uh, Puritan, some sort of Anglican leanings too. Um, but very unusually, he speaks uh, quite explicitly of the patristic doctrine of deification. Um, so he quotes Athanasius, for example. As Athanasius speaks, God was therefore incarnated and made us man, uh, sorry, and made man that he might deify us. And the end goal of life is to achieve the same kind of consciousness and self activity that exists primarily in the divine mind, right? So he speaks of acquiring a certain divine temper and constitution of soul, or having a godlike frame and disposition of spirit. Now, you might think that Codworth is being a little inconsistent here, because if his whole thing is we've got to be active and not determined by external forces, if we end up being driven by God's will and by the influences of God, isn't that just another way of being passive, right? Aren't you being just as passive as if you were being determined and necessitated by your lower appetites, um, just by instead of you know instinct to eat a cookie you're getting instincts from god or commandments from god and you're obeying those isn't that making you passive to god in the same way that eating the cookie was making you passive to your stomach uh and here cudworth also emphasizes just as he emphasizes that knowledge is not a knock or a thrust from without he emphasizes that the holy spirit who deifies us and makes us like god is not a pacifying with two s's right not a pacifying and it's not a force that makes you passive it's an activating or liberating force, right? He says uh, in a, a later sermon, he says, if the Holy Spirit were a mere external force acting upon the soul without the concurrence of an innate principle, then to be acted by the spirit would be a state of violence to the soul. Whereas the state of the spirit is a state of freedom and not of violence. And so to sort of sum that up, this is a really beautiful uh, quote from an earlier sermon of his. Um, he says, if we will nothing but what God wills, 
then we are acted by God himself and the whole divinity floweth in upon us. And where we have cashiered this self-will of ours, which did but shackle and confine our souls, our wills shall then become truly free, being widened and enlarged to the extent of God's own will. So that's a state where you achieve the kind of consciousness, the kind of pure self-activity that is proper only to God, even though it involves being conformed to God. And in a way, it involves becoming it involves becoming less free, in inverted commas, in the sense that you no longer have multiple choices about things that you can do, right? You only want to do what God wills. You don't also feel the desire to do things that God doesn't will. But Codworth thinks of that not as a kind of restriction, but as a kind of liberation. Um, that's something that he's getting from late antiquity. Uh, yes, okay, so to conclude and tie all that together, uh, for Cudworth, consciousness is not just a morally neutral feature of mental life, it's a moral feature of human life, right? It's the part of us or the aspect of our mental lives that makes us able to act with intention and with moral responsibility. And consciousness in that sense belongs supremely to God. That kind of self-awareness is a property of God and everything else, even the least conscious things, uh, are in some way or other just reflections or imitations to varying degrees uh, of that consciousness. And the moral uh, responsibility of human life is to become as conscious and godlike as possible in that way, um, which means to not be pushed about and driven by external things, but to activate the image of God that is within ourselves, because only then are we really acting from ourselves, and only then can our actions really be attributed to us properly. Um, so, yes, it is an unusual and in many ways it, uh, unusual perspective, and in many ways it doesn't fit nicely and neatly into uh, the ways that we think about consciousness. Um, but I still think it's, uh, it's worth th uh, thinking about, especially for Christians who are thinking about um, the philosophy of mind and consciousness. Uh, he shows us a really, he gives us a kind of philosophical framework, quite different to Descartes, but that could still be uh, sort of mined really interestingly um, by people who know a bit more about neuroscience and uh, the philosophy of mind than myself. So yeah, I hope that um, sort of, you know, uh, is interesting to you in uh, some way, or or I uh, hope that sort of piques your interest in Codworth a little bit. Um, I'll, I'll stop there and throw over to, uh, to Doru for, for questions. Thank you, Sam. Wonderful and uh, so informative uh, and, and exciting. I have to uh, agree with you. Uh, not many people, this is one of them, uh, knew of Cudworth uh, before your talk, so uh, I'm very grateful. I, I noticed there are a couple of people uh, with uh, uh, questions or comments. Uh, a, a few points on my part. I noticed, and it makes sense, you know, to compare and contrast uh, uh, Cudworth and uh, and Descartes, but perhaps uh, we shouldn't rush to uh, uh, judge uh, Descartes so uh, uh, summarily. He responded to certain issues. It, it was already this uh, rise of naturalism that actually killed the consciousness, killed the mind, and he, he uh, wanted to make sure that there's a room in this uh, vastness uh, of the universe uh, for, for for consciousness so that that's something to to, to remember the context is uh, is always important but yes uh, from uh, from the viewpoint of your uh, uh, comparison yes the cards uh, uh, is a very uh, weak simplistic uh, uh, theory of of the mind again about the card I think, uh, it's more like the Cartesians who did him not quite a service by uh, highlighting the binary uh, mind-body or mind-matter. Uh, because Descartes himself as a believer, he looked for uh, God as uh, the connection between mind and body. So it, it's not quite so uh, clear cut uh, in, in Descartes' own uh, uh, terms uh, that uh, uh, is just uh, a, a impoverished reality that we are talking about, you know, mind and and uh, uh, the rest extends science so on and so forth. But I'll I'll stop here. There are a few more more things that I would like to to share with you. But uh, time flies, and let's go first to Philip. I, I was just quer querying um, whether the division between the moral choice is so clear. Um, we had a 
cocker spaniel when I was young, trained to not take the 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 biscuits, lie down in front of the biscuits until he was um, told he could have them. We came back to the room quite forgetting one day, half an hour later, he was still sitting there drooling and not taking the biscuits. And um, you see dogs behaving, you know, with their tail between their legs and whatnot. So just just querying um you, we we train young children in often in um ways that smack of beha of behavioral training too in terms of their choices and how much of our moral choice could be said to have been trained into us culturally or through upbringing whatever that's a really good point for them yeah maybe yeah i probably use that example because i have a bad dog who i could never trust to uh um, to not eat a cookie in front of him. He's very undisciplined. Um, but yeah, you're, you're of course absolutely right. I mean, I think the way that Cudworth would probably read that is that the way that you train a dog anyway is through their sensual appetites. So really all you're doing when you're training them to re refrain from doing certain things that they have instincts for is you're just, you know, often we would use food in dog training. Yeah. Um, so what you're doing is you're just sort of rewiring the instincts that they're passive to and you're sort of taking one instinct and sort of using it to overpower another. So they get you the instinct. Say that about pot, potty trading and children. Too. Well, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, this also gets really interesting when you think about sort of human development too. I mean, one of the things I like about Codworth is that because he's less, um, he's less binary, there is more room for sort of, you know, he, he sees sort of proto-personhood even in animals. Um, so, you know, he, he, it could be that he's sort of recognizing the beginnings of something like moral responsibility as well in sort of, you know, well-trained dogs. Um, and, and yeah, so, I mean, I think, yeah, that these are very sort of fine grained and nuanced phenomena. Um, and they sort of, yeah, they exist much more in spectrums than on sort of on off switches. But yeah. But I mean, I still, I still think he could probably incorporate examples like that into his, um, into his system. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. Um, I'm going to have to go, but I really appreciated your talk. Thank, thank you. you. And I, I see a, a poem there by uh, uh, Carlos Williams, uh, sent by Charles. Charles, do you care to comment? Well, I, I thought, I wonder what, what you make of the line, forgive me, or what Cudworth, sorry, makes of the line, yeah. forgive me, because it seems to be, is that level four consciousness then? <laughs> He's done it even though he knows he oughtn't to. But yeah. he is very repentant all the same. That's right. That's right. Yeah, that's that's it's I mean, it's a good illustration of the um, well, I suppose it's after the fact. So he might have, you know, he might have done it thinking it was the right thing to do. And then in retrospect, he's looking back and thinking, oh, I shouldn't have done that. Um, but yeah, I mean, it probably is an illustration of the sort of thing that Codworth doesn't think is possible. And he's really just it's going back to sort of Plato and Socrates, the idea that we only ever do what we judge to be right in the moment. And all moral failures boil down to a, a failure to judge things properly. Um, so, uh, yeah, I mean, that is, yeah, that's a controversial position, but it just sort of it's Cudworth's um, his basic moral categories are platonic. So that's where uh, that's where that's coming from. Mm. Yeah, it, could be, it could be interesting to talk about that. I'd love to hear people's thoughts. Um, not, not very nuanced. Um, yeah. You know, that this is, you know, that. That's the that I thought of it as a joke, this poem, but it is that does illustrate the, the lack of nuance, perhaps. Yeah, yeah. Is, uh, talking about uh, animals, uh, it's uh, I think very uh, very interesting, uh, and and I wonder, uh, Sam, if uh, Cudworth, whom you you said uh, had some uh, dealings with the patristic tradition, if uh, uh, there are traces there of uh, that kind of let's call it psychology of the saints. Uh, where uh, you, you see all these examples with uh, uh, saints and, and animals. At times, you know, uh, I mean, from a distance, that sounds crazy. Why would you, well, barter uh, a, a kind of agreement, a covenant uh, with an animal? You know, saints and lions, for instance, in, in the Palestinian desert, 6th century or, or so. Uh, and, and then the saint gets uh, cranky. Uh, and mad because the lion uh, falls from grace. Uh, are there <laughs> signs of this kind of uh, thinking uh, in Cudworth, or uh, this is a bit too much? That's very interesting. Yeah, because what 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 
is happening in those stories is there's this sort of it's even it even comes up in iconography sometimes that there's this almost humanization of the animals you know yeah. they're sort of yeah. they're sometimes depicted with very human faces when they're standing next to um some very holy ascetic figure um I think there are traces they're very slight but there are traces of that in Cudworth he does draw on so he has an unusual I mean it's very unusual position but he draws it from some particular church fathers I think Oregon in particular but he believes that animals are present in the new heaven and the new earth particular animals that lived here are resurrected and sort of come back and enjoy an afterlife um, and he views that as a sort of you know it's part of the sanctification of the creation that happens where everything on the lower levels is sort of drawn closer up towards God so there's a sort of in the same way that we're deified you know I don't, he wouldn't go so far as to say they sort of become human but they are sort of humanized and they um you know in the same way that we see in the stories of the saints where animals suddenly become capable in the presence of you know Saint Isaac the Syrian of you know basically making agreements and covenants and sort of morally improving themselves um yeah there's definitely a trace of that in Cudworth's um public system I can send you some passages if you're interested on a yeah yes uh, edgy I, I 17th century too. Anglican take on that yeah hmm. Yeah. Uh, yeah, but anyway, you, you mentioned uh, his interest in, in Platonism or the broader Platonic tradition, and of course, uh, there are many similarities between uh, what you presented uh, as his uh, view of uh, this kind of uh, progress progression towards consciousness, you know, uh, or actualizing uh, the fact of being conscious, uh, and uh, Christian Platonists like Gregory of Nyssa. Uh, in his famous uh, book on the making of the human being, Gregory has this uh, uh, kind of idea that, yes, apart from minerals, and you, you showed us a, a rock there that was just a rock, you know, uh, absolute p passivity, which we know is false. Even the rocks can grow. Uh, Gregory uh, talks about uh, uh, the soul as a common denominator to plants, animals, humans, and he adds angels. Uh, but there are various degrees of soul or the presence of the soul. So from a, uh, this viewpoint, I think there's a clear reverberation in, in Cudworth, you know, this uh, early Christian Platonism. Uh, and uh, uh, yeah, uh, it, it's amazing this uh, return to ancient forms of thinking uh, in order to uh, find his way in the emerging modern era. Yeah. That's why I find him so interesting. That's that's really well put, Father. Yeah, 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 yeah. Because he's basically he's he's thinking in very patristic and Platonic categories. But the problems he's dealing with are problems raised by Descartes and Rob and, and Francis Bacon and that sort of thing. Yeah, absolutely. With the computer in mind, and simply comment that computers these days are looking at themselves a lot of the time, reflecting on themselves. So if they can think in some modest way, are they not also conscious? And this triggered a memory in me of Dilhard Bashada's book, The Phenomenon of Man, where he discusses precisely this in the light of what were then newish computers and said, well, maybe this is what happened in the human brain. It was able to turn in on itself. And the quote, I think he says, thought was born. Any comments? Yeah, very interesting. I mean, I, Cudworth would have been quite so yeah, you know, he couldn't have conceived of the kinds of things <laughs> computers can do now. So he would have had to um, rethink a lot of things. I mean, I think what he would probably th the thing that would worry him about calling a computer conscious is the sense that at least you know AI is different and interesting, but in the in a sort of fundamental sense, computers are still quite passive. They're programmed to do certain things, and they can only they're sort of determined by their programming in the way that animals are determined by their instincts. So they might sort of rise to the level of animal consciousness, but even then, you know, there's still obviously the question in philosophy of mind today about whether there's an actual subjective experience accompanying the sorts of, we're only observing the outward behaviors, you know, so chat GPT can respond to a question, but we have no insight into whether or not there is some sort of subjective experience. If there's a subject to whom anything is happening, because that's not an empirically testable thing. Um, so I feel like Cudworth would probably want to double down on that and say, it's just a very complicated mechanism. It has the sorts of, you know, it's the kind of consciousness he talks about, like in spiders, right, where it's very ordered and very, it's a very complex mechanism, but it's only a, you know, that's what he calls like a shadowy imitation of mind rather than actual mind. 
it's sort of it's the sort of complexity that you can only get from the activity of a mind from a programmer in this case um, but it doesn't itself have the actual subjectivity or the kinds of um, like the reflective capacities that create real moral responsibility I think that's probably what he would say but yeah I, I, I am still getting my own head around what chat GPT and what AI mean for consciousness so I yeah I would say that very tentatively I think you're underestimating computers it's quite possible. Yeah. What What does ChatGPT do? But when no one asks questions. Yeah. yeah exactly. Yeah. <laughs> okay. There's another uh, question there from Joanne. What is the innate uh, principle? Would you like to uh, develop a bit this question, Joanne? Oh, that's from the quote about the spirit is liberating. Yes, um, yes I remember. Put it back up. But yes, yes. So that's where he says that um the it would be violence the holy spirit would be sort of acting violently upon us unless there was an innate principle in us so i think the way that i would read that in cudworth is he's talking about the image of god um so the idea is that our soul is already created on the blueprint of god himself so when the holy spirit comes and sort of applies force so to speak that force is in the direction only of making us more what we already are right he's just sort of uncovering a structure an innate principle that's already part of ourselves um so that when the spirit is sort of flowing in over us he's not deforming us he's making us more ourselves he's not making us more passive he's just sort of actualizing and, and liberating yeah it's quite a, it's a, it's a quite a beautiful principle because he that he sort of applies that to education as well he says that's what a good teacher is good teacher isn't someone who impresses their own mind on their students but who sort of allows them to become who they really are that's the difference between sort of indoctrination and education um so yeah i hope that helps clarify the right. thank you yes Charles. thank you and uh, it seems charles uh, is on fire tonight i'm a little bit um dubious about the notion about Anne's notion of the um of the self-reflective computer but it can monitor and make and decide but i don't think a computer can act guiltily whereas i think that the eating of the plums could be a guilty pleasure. That is one undertaken with conscious guiltiness at the time that it was done and not just reflected in, in it afterwards. So, um, yeah, I think we have, it's kind of a mechanistic model that, I mean, a wonderful model, but perhaps a little mechanistic that that we've got. And, and, and people violate that model all the time. Computers, I don't think have yet. We, um, keep expecting them to and maybe they will so that, that's more of a comment than a or not directed at you we should probably ask chat gpt since we're speaking about it, it <laughs> have a chance to answer for itself thanks charles yeah, so i was just going to say um that this all fits so well with you know evolution which you didn't really stress but um but also sort of fits in with the sort of process ideas of the 20th century you know where you have increasing amounts of but what worries me i think is just that plants get a bit of a short shrift in this you know they're only almost conscious whereas there's all this evidence that perhaps they're a bit more conscious than than people have ever you know supposed <laughs> mm, mm, mm. that's quite true i mean one of the things i didn't talk about because it's just really sort of weird um but he ha he has he sort of adopts the it's an old platonist idea about a world soul so the sort of everything, and I think this would include plants, but sort of rocks and everything, they're sort of all animated by this um, sort of, it's not it's not quite the platonic world soul because it's not really a divine, it's not the Holy Spirit that's moving plants and animals. It's this sort of lesser sort of, I don't know if it's an angel. I don't think he thinks it's conscious. It's this sort of, it's basically like a force of nature, um, but it is something like a very, very weak mind. So that might be where he sort of is willing to grant like sort of yeah very faint shadows of consciousness to um plants but um yeah yeah no that that is a fair point i think he's still covered with is still within that very sort of modernizing tendency that's sort of disenchanting the world so you know mm -hmm. where yeah yeah the past was willing to um so, you know especially in like mythology they're willing to see you know individual trees as having thoughts and um you know being almost sort of haunted by a tree spirit um Cudworth is sort of on that trend towards something more uh less less enchanted I just looked uh, back at my notes for Joanna's at Joanna's first uh presentation and she defined consciousness as a feeling or perceiving or experiencing and I'm wondering whether 
the way in which Samuel, the way in which you've defined uh, consciousness through um, Padworth is more a definition of self-consciousness rather than consciousness per se. Mm. Would you like to comment on that, please? Yeah, that's actually, that's really interesting. I mean, the more I think about it, I think that's probably right. I mean, it's not, yeah, I mean, it's, uh, kind of kind of want to put a disclaimer as well saying you know i'm trying to represent codworth's views i have very few settled views on consciousness so i mean but as a description of codworth's views um i think that's probably right because what he calls consciousness is just that feeling um that sub subjectivity and experience which is something that he sees in animals right but what he thinks they lack is I wonder if he actually, I would have to go back and check. I think he might actually use the term like self-conscious to describe the higher level of consciousness that has this sort of added moral um, element. And I mean, yeah, self-consciousness sounds a bit like a negative term. It sounds like a sort of, you know, embarrassment or, um, but it's that sense of sort of looking at oneself and evaluating oneself, um, whether, you know, positively or negatively. Um, in that sense, yeah, I think that is what he's describing as like characteristically human, uh, human consciousness. And then that exists supremely in God, right, where it's not self consciousness in the sort of negative sense of sort of looking at oneself and wishing one was better. Um, but it's just sort of perfect alignment of oneself with oneself. There's no um, sort of division or there's nothing in him that resists what he is. Whereas we have all these inner contradictions and conflicts and so on. Yeah, thank you. We are getting almost there. I have a quick one, Sam. You mentioned something which I believe is very important. So all this harks back to the topic of theological anthropology. So from all this, we learn something about ourselves. And I think this is one of the things, beautiful things of, of this, almost this entire series that of seminars that taught us that uh, everything that uh, we, we uh, discuss, regardless uh, what that topic is, from panpsychism to um, uh, artificial intelligence, chat GPT, and, uh, and so on and so forth. We, we went through uh, all sorts of topics. There's something for us always. There's a lesson that concerns us. There's some wisdom that concerns us. And I think uh, uh, what you uh, told us, shared with us tonight, uh, is uh, um, very much along the same lines. I, I remember something in uh, Clement of Alexandria, because you, you mentioned him at some point, he actually uh, uh, believed that there were uh, three kinds of people, uh, not uh, through predestination, but through decision as outcomes of, uh, of their uh, choices, uh, moral choices and, and way of life. He called uh, the highest them, the most achieved, spiritually achieved gods, small g. Yeah. Uh, then regular people, humans, and beasts. And I think Cutworth would, uh, would uh, uh, have resonated uh, very well with this uh, uh, typology. What do you reckon? Uh, yeah, I absolutely agree. And I think actually Clement is one of the people that um, Cutworth quotes explicitly a lot. So that's probably not a coincidence. Um, yeah, 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 yeah. You mentioned Gregory of Nyssa earlier, because I was also thinking as you were speaking about his, uh, yeah, because in On the Making of Man, he also describes many of the vices that we fall prey to as they, they're sort of proper to animals and their vices in human beings because they involve when a human being falls into them it's below their nature right but there's this sort of like fundamental there's this sense that we are part animal um but our moral responsibility is to live beyond that um, which means living beyond instinct um sort of controlling or subordinating instinct to the the higher more divine godly principle that you're describing there in saint clement um yeah absolutely yeah yeah so yeah, I think yeah, in terms of sort of practical takeaway, I think that's the that's the thing I, I get from Cudworth. His his advice is to be uh, intentional and aware in everything, right? It's unreflective action that is the most dangerous moral, um, uh, like this moral slippery slope for most of us. So we should uh, keep forward. Thank you for uh, keep uh, yeah pushing forward uh, to to try to uh, overcome our. Uh, weaknesses, shortcomings, limitations, and so on and so forth to keep growing towards uh, the divine likeness. Thank you very much, Sam. This has been amazing, beautiful Thank you. Thank festival. You. Uh, and uh, uh, while uh, uh, we might uh, uh, still spend a few moments, uh, if Sam agrees, uh, after the conclusion of, uh, of the seminar, uh, I'd invite uh, uh, Nicola to uh, conclude with, uh, with prayer for us.
Thank you, Doro. And, and thank you so much, Samuel. That was amazing. Um, let us pray. Loving and invisible God, we thank you for this day, which is just beginning or just ending. For the chance to meet across these invisible channels around the world and for the long work and deep thought that goes into presenting and responding to these talks and for the community that is building around these events across our two countries. Thank you for Samuel and his wisdom and erudition and for bringing to life these voices from the past. We give thanks for all the talents and gifts of those who organize these events and make them visible. Oh God, bless us and keep us. Make your face to shine upon us. Turn your face towards us and give us peace. Amen.